The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Also in the news, Tether, whose digital currency USDT is pegged one to one to the US dollar, is using its reserves to loan $1 billion to the Celsius network and other crypto firms using Bitcoin as collateral, according to a Bloomberg investigative report. And that report saying that Tether has loaned billions more to Chinese corporates. Joining us now to discuss is Timothy Massett, senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School and former chair of the CFTC. Hi there, Timothy. Happy Friday. So is it concerning to you that a $68 billion stablecoin issuer that is ostensibly supposed to hold $1 for every one Tether issued is lending out billions to crypto firms and billions more to large Chinese firms? Yes, it's, it's very much a concern. And this is the problem, I think, with stable coins. You know, they're, they've grown enormously. It's $120 billion now, outstanding. But we really don't have a regulatory framework that ensures that those reserves will be safely invested. And, you know, I've written about the fact that you could have a crypto token that breaks the buck. That's a phrase, you know, we use with money market funds. Uh, that happened in the 2008 global financial crisis when one of the oldest, most revered money market funds had 1% of its assets in Lehman paper. And when Lehman went bankrupt, there was a run on that money market fund, which then triggered a broad scale run on lots of money market funds. It was only stopped by the US Treasury guaranteeing. Them. We don't want to see that kind of a run. Now, there is a stickiness to, I think, people's use of stable coins because they do serve a function very important function in the crypto market. But what I'd like to see is a regulatory framework that ensures those reserves are safely invested, ensures liquidity, so that we could even contemplate potentially broader use of stable coins, because I, I do think uh, they could help modernize our payment system. It's one means we could use to modernize our payment system. Timothy, welcome back to the show. Um, for our viewers who are not as familiar with your report and your thoughtful analysis, yeah. can you just break down very simply what kind of regulation you are recommending? Because there are you know, sure. various proposals out there ranging from let's re regulate stablecoin issuers as banks or let's regulate it as a security. So if you could just break down very simply what you think is the best path for regulation. Sure, sure, Emily. There are some different paths. I think, first of all, it's important to step back and just talk about what types of regulation are we looking for, and then we can talk about who's best positioned to do that, who has the authority to do that. And I would say, first, you want what we would call prudential regulation, meaning that stablecoin issuers who basically say in one way or another that the tokens are pegged to the dollar, should be required to invest those assets in very safe things, whether that's cash uh, deposits in FDIC-insured banks is obviously one of the safest. Um, you could include treasury securities. Um, you know, you could contemplate them having direct accounts at the Fed. So that's one thing. Secondly, you want liquidity measures to ensure that they can honor redemptions. You also want operational resilience measures. You know, these, these stable coins, many of them operate on multiple blockchains, not just one. And that uh, multiplies the risk that a software bug or hack could be a problem. So you want resilience requirements and then you want some consumer protection. Now, how do you get those? Well, one way I've suggested is the Financial Stability Oversight Council can conduct a review and uh, and then it would have the authority to uh, impose some risk management standards if it determined that stable coins are or are likely to become uh, systemically important. There are some other uh, ways you could go to. As you mentioned, you could sort of look at them as bank deposits. Uh, but I think the first thing we need to do is have uh, a complete review of these. The FSOC uh, could do a review and it could require uh, stablecoin issuers to provide some information, and that would help us really get a handle on uh, what are the risks and how should we best manage them. Yeah. So Commissioner Massad, you, 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 um, you don't necessarily view um, stablecoins as securities, correct? You, you, you seem to be uh, unwilling yeah. to give it that label. Why is that? Why wouldn't you well, categorize yeah. it? Or are there, are there stablecoins there that you say, yes, those are 
pretty much securities and the others aren't. Well, that's a, that's a great question, Lawrence. And people have suggested you could view them that way. I think of them as a payment system more than an investment. And that's why, you know, even though I, I recognize the argument that you could treat them as securities, and some of them obviously um, maybe more are more like, there's a better argument to treat them than others. But I think it would be better to view them as a payment mechanism. I think that's what they were designed for, right? They were designed to facilitate uh, people investing in crypto, buying and selling from different exchanges, moving value between different tokens. They weren't really designed as investments. Uh, people don't expect to get a return on Tether. Uh, they expect just to get you know, their dollars back at the time when they uh, wish to redeem them. So that's why I say, let's not regulate them as securities. Let's regulate them more as a payment system. So stepping back, I mean, the, the, the big philosophical question here is, why do stable coins need regulation? You know, if we think about the cryptocurrency market in general, the whole idea is that it was supposed to be an alternative to the current financial system that we have. So why not leave it to caveat emptor? Why not let people decide for themselves what stable coins they can trust, which ones they can't, and, you know, just say, look, you guys want to put money in Tether? Put money in Tether. Who cares? Sure. Well, I think it's because we've learned that caveat emptor ends badly. Uh, it ends badly for investors, but it can also end badly for our system. But when it, something like stablecoins grow as big as they've grown, and they could even become bigger, they do potentially pose uh, risks to financial stability. And that's why I think we, we do need regulation. Now, of course, I've said we need better regulation for the entire uh, crypto industry. Uh, I, you know, I want it to be regulated in a way that, that allows people to have confidence in what they're investing, to feel like there's not manipulation or fraud risks. Um, and I think it will be a healthier industry that way. Um, the fact this, that it's grown up without that doesn't mean it's entitled to continue to, uh, to be unregulated. But, but if we step aside and, and think about it, I mean, like, why should, if once we regulate the crypto industry, once we regulate stable coins, aren't we essentially giving a false sense of security to investors into thinking, oh, you know what, a government regulates it, it should be fine, when in fact, the crypto markets can be uh, accessed throughout the world through non-US actors, uh, if all sorts of fraud can exist in it that uh, in terms of wash trading and things like that, that wouldn't necessarily fly in the right. U.S. Aren't we sort of giving a false sense of security to American investors if it's regulated well, in the I United States? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. I don't think that should make us delay, though. I think what we need, frankly, is is worldwide regulation. And really, the analogy, one of the analogies here, is swaps. Right, the over-the-counter swap market was unregulated, and uh, the big banks said, "Oh, this doesn't need to be regulated." You know, people know what they're doing and they're big boys and they can take the risks and so forth. And then what happened in the financial crisis? Well, you know, we had we had some some serious problems because of credit default swaps. Those really intensified the crisis. The U.S. government had to step in and uh, stabilize AIG at the cost of one hundred and eighty billion dollars. Now, much of the swaps market was perfectly fine during the crisis, but the credit default swaps basically almost took you know, our entire financial system under. Um, after that, we enacted reforms and we did that worldwide. You know, we had the G20 uh, uh, nations agree to a set of principles as to how they would regulate swaps. And frankly, I think the same thing is needed for crypto. We need to have international agreement. And some countries are gonna move faster than others. We move faster. Uh, than other countries on swap regulation. And there was some, you know, criticism of that. But today, where are we? We've got basically very similar uh, regulations in place around the world. And the swaps industry will say we're better off for it. So to come at this question from a slightly different angle, I think what might be helpful is that, you know, a lot of people are out there saying if the stablecoin market collapsed, there'd be like a run on stablecoins and this would reverberate throughout the financial system. Could you maybe spell out a little bit what that would look like? Because a lot of these sort of doomsday predictions are a little bit vague, and I think it makes it hard for people to see why this would be such a big deal. 
Sure, they are, because we often don't know exactly what the connections are. Uh, that's the problem. It is a big market, and that's why I think Secretary uh, Yellen of the Treasury and others are very concerned. It's grown to $120 billion. What would happen in a run, we don't know for sure. Uh, that's one of the things I think we need to get a better handle on. But given its size and given the fact that a run could uh, take place and really escalate very quickly, again, I said, you know, there's a certain stickiness to the use of Tether. I think that's true. Uh, investors typically aren't bothered by slight variations in the price. But if you really had something that triggered concern, that concern's going to mount. Because what happens in a crisis? Whenever there are rumors of a failure, the failure becomes real, right? I mean, it's self-fulfilling because people say to themselves, well, I'm not going to wait. And so then you do have a rush to the exits. And what you don't know then is the collateral consequences of that. And particularly because there is a fair amount of leverage today in the entire crypto sector. And, you know, we have more and more uh, hedge funds and other institutions getting into it. Um, that's what's a concern. We really don't know what those uh, ramifications would be, but they could be significant. Yes. Except, Commissioner Massad, if Tether decides not to redeem, they're not legally forced to redeem because they're unregulated. So if they say, look, you guys want to redeem, you want to redeem your Tether for dollars, we, we, don't got, we don't have to give it to you. I mean, that, that's kind of been an accusation sure. floating around for a while that they're not redeeming. So could there be a run on something right. if you can't redeem it? But then what happens uh, with other uh, stable coins? What happens with the um, lending arrangements that have grown up around Tether? What happens then to the Bitcoin market because of the interactions between Tether and Bitcoin? You know, there's twice as much trading of Tether than there is of Bitcoin. And if those things start to happen, you know, what happens to Ethereum and, and other things when people get very nervous about the whole sector? Uh, these well, things no, no one's escalate ever... very quickly. No one's ever gotten into the crypto market saying this is a safe bet and it's not volatile. I mean, that's sort of not well, what they've been doing. Well, that's that's fair enough. But, you know, when you start to have a market this big, yeah. two trillion yeah. plus overall in the crypto market, uh, there can be consequences to, you know, the broader financial system uh, that we don't want. I um, address some aspects of your article saying that, you know, but the, the things like Tether, stable coins, they're addressing real inefficiencies in the current payments uh, financial sector. And um, much like, you know, in the early days of crypto, when crypto exchanges came out, and, like Mt. Gox, uh, Quadriga in Canada, uh, they were the only things that were available. And so people took a huge risk, not really understanding or knowing the governance of these exchanges and the custody of these exchanges. But it, it, there was a real need for them. And in the same case for Tether, there's a real need for stable coins. And so it's almost like you're going in blind, but you're taking the risk because there is a demand and and a need or want to access this, these markets. Um, that being said, I wanted to ask you about a comment you made earlier about the stable coins using different blockchains. I'm actually not familiar with that. So I uh, just want sure. you to elaborate on that. Well, US, USD coin operates on five different blockchains today, and it's said that it wants to expand that potentially by 10 more. Uh, and my point is simply that, you know, when you have it operating on a lot of different blockchains, that just increases your concern about, um, you know, potential problems on, on any one of those blockchains with software deficiencies, hacks, whatever. Uh, if you had it on one blockchain, would that cause other people holding holding USD coin who don't even understand they're on a different chain uh, to suddenly say, oh, I got to get out of this. Let me go back, though, to your point about about the function that stable coins play, because I, I just want to clarify my view here. Um, I, I would take a slightly different, different uh, cast on it than you did. My point about stable coins is that while they're only used in the crypto industry, um, the reason they're used is because you can't move value in and out of a crypto exchange or in and out of a different token quickly by converting back and forth directly into, say, U.S. dollars. 
right? If you make a wire transfer, it can take longer. And so that's the deficiency, if you will, that I think stable coins point out, that our payment system, you know, overall, it's very good. And for most people, it works just fine. And we've got lots of electronic options, right? I've got mobile banking. I've got my credit cards. But the fact is, our U.S. system is slower than in other countries. And uh, that slowness and its relatively high cost puts a particular burden on low-income people. And, you know, we can go into that if we have time. But that's why I've said, look, stablecoins point out the need to improve our payment system, to modernize it. Whether we do that through stablecoins or the Fed's initiative called FedNow or CBDCs, you know, there's lots of options. Um, but my point is simply we need to modernize the payment system, not just regulate the risks of stablecoins. That Fed report as we